Who doesn't get that sinking feeling when the credit card bill shows up? Many people do. And that's why we turn to a certified financial therapist. There are only 300 of them in the United States. And we found the one from Certified Financial Therapist. Simi Mandelbaum joined us from New Jersey. And she explained how money management is super important. You can't be doing this blindly. You have to know where your money's going. She gave actionable tips for the listening audience. I think you'll like this episode. Without further ado, Simi Mandelbaum. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. Welcome to another episode of Kosher Money. I'm your host, Ellie Langer, and today we're privileged to have Simi Mandelbaum from Tom's River. Yep. Welcome. Great to have you. We wanted to discuss budgeting. What is budgeting? It sounds scary. No one wants to budget. Is budgeting a scary thing? You know, uh, it's funny when you ask that word, budgeting. To me, I feel like it's a belt. Who wants to wear a tight belt? So I really don't like to think of it as budgeting. I think I like to think of it as management. We all like to manage things. We all like to feel like we're in control. And so I don't like that word, budgeting. So what should we call it? Management. I, I, or, or Money management. Yeah. Let's manage our money. Let's manage our money. I think a lot of the issue is that we think of budgeting, we think of this, we associate money and budgeting, and money is associated with a lot of emotion, and a lot of it is negative. And so the minute we think of budgeting, it's all of a sudden means limiting or stopping or restrictions, control. But rather, I want to control my money rather than my, my money controls me. So you've had people that have sat with you, and we'll get into what you do, but people that have so-called budgeted and then felt that they've had even more money to spend than they anticipated or so, or so they thought? So people that have allowed themselves to watch their money and be interested in how it works for them and recognize that, hmm, it ain't working for me in the way I want it to work. So maybe I want to tweak things to make it work the way I want to work. Are people coming to you when it's far too late in the game, if they had come to you earlier? And tell us a little bit about what you do. I, I know, uh, but for the listening audience, we always like to say we have dozens of listeners. Um, what is it that you do? How do you help people? So, great question. Thanks a lot for asking. So, I deal with the anxiety that comes with money. So, people are coming to me whether or not they have money. So, whether money, money is a struggle. Whether they have loads of money or they have no money, money is, has a, a, a sense of anxiety for them. They could, people could be coming in with this, uh, $150,000 and $20,000 in a bank account. And a couple sitting in front of me, husband is stressed out of his mind, his anxiety out the roof. His wife is calm as a cucumber saying, we have $20,000. We are awesomely excited. And he's like, we don't have enough for next month. So there's an element of anxiety. That's why they're coming to me. It's irrelevant. The, the financial part is an, a framework by which we help them to, uh, uh, to understand about what's going on. But what we're dealing with is what's going on for them, how they're using their money. Is it working for them? And so when you're saying budgeting, I'm saying like, let's, let's just, just take that word away. Let's just work with, let's start making our money work for us. So you mentioned in that example that it's the husband that's freaking out and it's the wife that's cool, calm, and collected. Is that because the, the husbands tend to deal with the finances? I know um, I was talking to a friend and he says, I'm the one who manages in that particular relationship. I'm the one who manages the finances, the bills, etc. My wife really doesn't have a, you know, when I need to keep things in line, I say, hey, spend less on Amazon. Um, should it be both uh, pair, uh, both members in, in the marriage f dealing with the finances, um, paying the bills? Should it be a collaboration or is it better that you isolate the finances into one, one side of the marriage? So ideally, whenever, you're, whenever a person's headed to a goal, you want to get there. You want to have a collaboration to get to a common goal. 
Now, we can get there in numerous ways. So it doesn't have to be where we both have to pay the bills. We both have to work in the same way to get to the same goal, but we both want to have a common goal, whether that's we both want to make weddings or, or events or we both want to take vacations and enjoy life. Maybe um, Mrs. would like to do so by being more cautious or Mr. would like to do so by saving more. However, they want to achieve their goal, but the common goal should be the same. So I feel like it's important, and I think that's the biggest pain point in, Mm -hmm. in relationships is that we don't communicate well about money. We sort of get stuck when it comes to money. A lot of emotion comes in between, and we don't know how to get our feelings across. It sort of becomes maybe a blame game or mm-hmm. harshness between the couple. But when when do you have that conversation, right? I come home from work. My wife's like, how was work? I'm like, it was great. How are the kids? Kids are great. Uh, okay, what's for supper? And then, okay, it's time for bed. Like, you have do you have to isolate some sort of time focused on sitting at a dining room table, going through it, having an actual conversation. It's not just going to come up and say, oh, dinner was delicious. Thank you. I think now let's discuss our overall financial goals, right? Where where does this, um, does it start in your office? And let's walk through that. A couple calls you up and says, hi, we have money management issues. We need your help. What does that conversation look like? Well, wait, 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 wait. Let's go back. Go ahead. When, when I'm, I'm really hoping, and this is my hope for everyone in the future, is when a couple gets married, they sit down and they go through these common goals. And, you know, I, I like to call it, we have something called date night. It's even on our spreadsheet, you know, mm-hmm. as an expense. We want to make sure you have a date night. You also should have a global night. What's a global night? We go through the events that have to be cared for in the family. Whose doctor's appointments need to take care of? What events are we doing? Any housework? What has to be done? In those conversations, let's go through our once our once a week. It's what's going on in our expense account? What's going on? What are we planning for? We're doing a yearly budget, a monthly. We're planning out our budget, our cash flow management. We want to see what's going on. So we want to constantly make that appointment because it's sort of our maintenance package about what we're doing in our life like anything else mm-hmm. and so they come into your office or you, so it, someone's calling yeah and they're like i don't know what's going on with my money i uh, uh, it's really stressful situation can we can we come down and, and just uh, my money's just walking out it has quicker feet than i can manage so uh so it will be something like uh they'll come down and the first thing i'm going to want to do is try to get an understanding of the, that framework of understanding of where their money is going. And so they're going to start getting their information together again just to get the framework of what we're dealing with. We call it like present position where, where we want to know what we're starting with. Where, what does it cost you to live today? We're aiming for somewhat of an 80% accuracy because it is quite a bit of information and we know a lot of different things happen in life so we don't know exactly what will come up. And where are they getting them? They're pulling, they're coming to you with all their credit card bills printed out prior. So um, when they're coming the first time, we'll have a conversation that doesn't sound exactly like what is going on with your financial right, life and right. give me your credit card bills and let's go through it. I'm going to want to more get an idea of what's going on for the couple. What have they tried before? How does money work for them? How do they earn it? How often do they get paid? I think there's a big uh problem when a person looks like they make enough money per year, Uh but the way they get paid is maybe commissions. They only get paid every three months or every Uh six months. So over the course of the year, they may have enough money, but guess what? Next month is not a paid month, and yet it's a holiday month, so their expenses is really high. And so they feel... constructed, they feel like they can't afford them their life, and they don't know what to do. And this goes on month one, month two. By month three, they're tight. They get their commission check. But by then, they have an, a debt that they've accrued. Mm-hmm. There's frustration. There's tension. There's all this gamut of emotion mm-hmm. that's negative. They can't get ahead. Mm-hmm. And so they're coming like, what's going on? I'm working so hard. It's not working. Do you see a lot of credit card debt? Is that a, a something that people are accruing. It's a quiet monster that's slowly building. I don't know how quiet that monster is. Quite oh, a loud it's, monster. It's loud. And that's, I guess, over the years, that's become a bigger issue. It's so, and we, we talked about this with Reb Naftali Horowitz. It's so easy to get a credit card and they entice you with all these points, et cetera. But a credit card is probably not the best method. If someone is a little bit behind, should they be, is, is that the best way to catch up? 
not only is it not the best method, it's almost a disaster in the loom. And they have these zero percentages. So we know we have 18 months on that teaser rate. And if you have someone who's really disciplined that has shown a really good history that can manage that, that has a one-time fall off, but in the general sense, not that is not really a method to fall back on consistently for a person. Mm -hmm. um, so where should they where should they get the money if they're if they're consist Are you asking for a, cons a person who cannot consistently? No, let's afford? talk. No, let's say let's say one time, right? They they do need that. There is a slower month in the in and or they do have a commission check that is a couple months out. They don't have the the liquidity right now. Should they be better off going to Gamach? Um, they're looking at their numbers. It's just not adding up. They you need know, they need they need that they need to fill the gap. One thing I find really really beautiful about the fact that we are a Jewish community, and we are part of a larger, beautiful force, and most of the people are associated with a shul, a rabbi. There is places to tap into community resources for just that, to help you through a certain period of time, if you can, um, to get through that if it's just a short period of time and not mm -hmm. long. But if this is something, like you're saying, a commission check, if someone's on a cyclical income, I really like to build in something like, I've done this with so many clients where we've built in a loan for whatever period of time that until they get that first commission check, and then the loan will get a little lower for the second round. Till, and then what happens, and I see it over and over again, mm -hmm. is when a person gets that first loan, and now they could start working with the Yeshiva Das that they can afford their life, because it's all we've, we've worked it through. Mm -hmm. We could afford it, it's just that he hasn't been able to get it on time. The ability the person has, that oomph to try harder, to want more, it, 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 it's a whole new arena. It allows them to, to soar, to make more, to want to do better. It, mm -hmm. It's amazing what it gives them. Their income increases just by allowing them that Yeshiva Das. I feel like success breeds success. And when your person's living in this negativity and, and horrible feeling that I can't do it, I can't afford my life, and over and over I'm continuously accruing that I have to borrow and borrow, that breeds negativity and that breeds not that feeling of, of, of failure and and I really hate I would love for people to get away from that feeling so what are some of the common pain points they walk into your office and you they're not coming with their credit card bills they're just having a conversation what are some of the issues that people bring up that you see is a bit common across families neighborhoods I feel like I'm on a hamster wheel no matter how much I I, I work there's the money goes out quicker than I can possibly earn. Um, something that holidays, they cost so much. It's as if each three months, bam, a new holiday occurred. Like what happened, you know, we had it a couple, like last year and the year before, but it seems that every time there's a new, we have new holidays, Baruch Hashem, right. it seems to be a whole new surprise every single time. I finally got my finances under control. It's a new season. It's camp season. It's holiday season. It's Yantif. So there seems to be a big stress on that. Um, new, the, another another common, the not, depending on the age and stage, I find that camps seem to take a big toll on people. Um, depending on simchas, support, again, depending on the age and stage of people, people commonly get into stresses about stages of life. Uh huh. And people can't fix this by themselves, right? Or it's very difficult. Someone listening to this podcast, do they need to, and, and they're experiencing some sort of issues, is it, you know, going on Google, looking up for different tips and articles about money management, or is this, you're much better, and I know there's a little bit of bias because this is what you do, but is it, are they better off going to, to a money manager, um, budgeting coach, um, financial advisor to help them walk through their finances, or... This is something that they can wing or they should try by themselves. Well, first off, mm -hmm. I want to address the fact that we don't learn about money in school. We don't have enough education about money. And so we sort of get married and are expected to know how to deal with money, how to earn it, how to use it, how to save it. Nobody tells us, nobody gives us keys to a car and says drive. 
Mm. We go for driver's ed, we go for driving lessons, we take an exam. And money w that has so much more impact in our life and we're not taught about that. I, wanna, I, want, I want people to understand and recognize that, that that's a reality and the reason I'm saying that is because very often when, a, when people are in a relationship, mm -hmm. they end up turning to the spouse and starting a blame game. You should have known. You should have done better. Hey, why didn't you know? How come you spend so much the way you were brought up? And there becomes all of a sudden this blame game when just in reality, we, they just weren't educated. Right. Money is something we're not. Parents generally don't discuss with children. It's sort of a hidden topic. So can people do this on their own? The answer is they can. But very often, too much emotion comes up, and so it's difficult. So if we can remove some emotion, and all we need is logic, which I, mean, I believe sometimes is difficult, but right. if we can, then we can simply look at numbers and try to see how they work. So is that how you remove emotion? Where logic, look at the numbers, and then once you have the data in front of you, the data will sort of guide you into your decisions and how to act. Because until you look at the numbers, like any business, right? You can't control the business until you look at the numbers and see where you're profitable, um, where you need to cut, et cetera. Um, is that how you remove the emotion? Because when I hear remove the emotion, I think of going into a room, taking some yoga, you know, breathe in, breathe out. Um, what does removing the emotion mean? I love that. So, and that's, that's really, that's the part where I love what I do, and this is my specialty, is first being able to identify those emotions, right? Because I can't remove something I don't understand. And, and understanding what I want from them. So, for example, what is, what, are, what is a money emotion? What is a money monster? I call them the money monsters. Mm -hmm. So, for example, someone may feel that a very strong need to give. They love to give their children. They love to give. It's important for them to give tzedakah. They may have grown up in a home where money was a very source of stress and it, there was a lot of limitation on money. And for them... When in their mind, they saw themselves, when they grow up, they're going to give. They're going to give their children everything they couldn't get. They're going to give the schools. They remember when they grew up, there was a problem with tuition. Their schools are going to get more than tuition. They're going to give bonuses to the Rebbeim. And yet, there's another element in the person that they have. So there's a, they have an element of one of their money habit, which would be a, a giving, and but they also have one that's strong and it's called planning. And then there's an element that's in their head and they're saying, is it enough? Is it too much that I'm giving? Am I giving too much of, of the charity? Am I giving too much of, for my children? Am I, and, they, and, they don't, and they're at odds with themselves. Mm. So they're looking at these numbers and they don't know what it really should reflect. They're uncertain about what to do with that. So, so giving, people can be short at the end of the month because they're giving too much charity? Have you seen that? Where Not only may they, they may be giving too much in general or more, too much charity, they may be holding debt and still giving charity, m more wow. charity, right? So their charity may be costing more or their tuitions may be costing their 27% more, right? Because uh -huh. they're having running those credit card debts. So it, in essence, it becomes when you can show them whatever your child's hoverboard and everything that you have to give them because of what you didn't get in, their ch in your childhood right. is costing them. Is that in line with really what you believe is important or is this something, once they can start making those decisions from a different place, now they could see, one second, but I want to have money in my future. Oh, but this is not in line with what I want. So they can start identifying how it looks on the paper. The n looking at numbers won't tell you stories. You have to be able to l had, know how to read the stories to be able to see it. Let's talk Amazon. Oh, God. I really did not like that question. Which Amazon? What was the Amazon question? How do, how do you not do Amazon? Yeah. I mean, Amazon, I, I look at my credit card bill. I'm guilty of it. It's so easy. It's an app. You push the button. Do you, first of all, do you see Amazon when you look at credit card bills? Well, first of all, yeah. I don't allow Amazon as a category in the spreadsheets. 
<laughs> it's I, letter I just don't a, even, it's right I don't even let Amazon because Amazon could be clothing, can be food, can be mis- it could be anything. Right. So I don't even let it. Right. Uh, I, I contacted Amazon to find out if they would somehow be able to filter and sort categories. Uh, I also contacted them to ask them if they would allow a certain number and then close down for that day if people could put limitations on it. So it really, it's... It, what did they, Amazon it, say? No, it, 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 they do have a way to filter. It was really difficult to do. So... Uh, but if I want if I want my card to only spend twenty five hundred dollars yeah. on Amazon, nah, um, can the credit card companies do that? I, like if I call Amex and say, okay, this is an approved retailer, but up until a certain amount, would they be receptive? That might be an option. About the credit card company may be an option because we've done that with credit cards. I haven't done that specifically with credit cards on a specific retailer, but that might be an option. Amazon is a scary thing. And you know what's interesting is yeah. that when we discussed on the phone the Monopoly experiment, you got the wrong Monopoly experiment. So tell, tell so, me about your Monopoly experiment. Okay. What did, what, so what the is Monopoly that? experiment that, we, that I discussed <laughs> was dad came home and was, was always playing with his kids' Monopoly. And he watched how his kids would just buy boardwalks or whatever else they were buying on the, board, uh, on the Monopoly game. And he decided he wanted to know if it would be any different if he went out and got real denominations instead of the fake dollar bills Mm -hmm. on the Monopoly game. So he went to the bank and got everything except for the $500 bill. Right. And he watched his kids play. And I think they were 15, 13, 9. I may be making this up in some some age group like that. And he watched them, son, daughter, and so. And it was interesting to see how his son, who was – who was usually very easy about purchases and bought everything out, was like a little more cautious in the way he played. His daughter was very lackadaisical and continued playing very easily with her money. And the other child was also very careful. And so he saw that there was a difference in the way they played just from the fact that they were holding real dollar bills. Mm. All right? So think about it. Everything that they're doing today is one step further away from its natural source. So we took the coin, we went to a dollar bill, we took the dollar bill, we went to a, a credit card. We took the credit card, we went to an Apple Pay. We went to an Apple Pay, now what, what do they have? They have these stores where you walk in and it already scans something around you mm-hmm. that's gonna scan your, you could just walk out, walk in, and it already charged you, you don't even feel it. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's an allergy. Imagine an allergy. When you have an allergy, you. You and you want to make sure you're not going to have an you're not going to have a reaction. You want to take the object and look at the ingredients and see that it has the least amount of ingredients and no preservatives, so you're not going to have a reaction to it. Taking it in its most natural form will make sure it's the healthiest for your body, right? Right. So when a person is having a hard time with money, you want to bring it down to the most natural source. So if your question is, how do we take a lid on something? Keep bringing it down to its natural source. So, so stay, stay, I'm in yeah. a big proponent of the envelope system. I don't, I don't tell you, yes, you must put cash in your envelope system. But if you're trying to keep a lid on Amazon, maybe Amazon should have a little envelope. And each time you put it on the card, maybe it should be in a cash envelope that you immediately take it, take it out and say, that's how much I got left in my Amazon little envelope. So tell or us about something. the envelope system. What is that? That's at the beginning of the month, you allocate X thousands of dollars into the envelope? Into separate envelopes. Okay. Oh, separate envelopes. So to you have... Different, to different places that you find, those are the places that you, that you have a difficult time with on the spending, that variable amount that you want to sort of keep a lid on. So you're not immediately cutting their credit cards in half. You're saying, how can we spend the money, but in a more tangible fashion? Mm -hmm. So even if you're using your credit card, you want to make sure that amount is in your account, right? We don't want to make, we don't want to spend what's not in our account because that we don't feel like we're spending if we're just swiping a card. Yeah, but the money's coming in on Friday. I mean, I know it's a few days away, but I'm going to get paid. We we never. So step one, we don't use money that's coming in. We use 30 day old money. Uh huh. That, That that's that's. Step one. So we, we try always to use 30-day old money. So that, that reduces anxiety right away. So that means money that's coming in Friday is for next month. Do you find that people that move to the envelope system spend less or more smartly? 
So once it, they it's not, an, it doesn't have, to, again, it doesn't have to be a legit envelope system, but it's an envelope brain system. Okay. So whether they're tracking that on their spreadsheets and using that system, okay. or whether they're using an actual envelope system, is irrelevant but the fact is that there is a some control method really is helpful for people what tools are people using I know you mentioned spreadsheet when you um, oh help, I yeah go ahead I love when people are using whether they use apps whether you and if they can use technology if they're comfortable with it there are so many good technology apps out there what do you recommend um, again there there are so many for different I, I, I hate to use a specific type because People have different experiences and people have different comfort levels. So depending on their comfort level, there is Mint, there is YNAB, which is you need a budget. There's every dollar. There's, did I say Quicken already? No. Uh, Quicken. Um, there's Money Guide, Money Blocks. There's so many different. Uh, there's something now they just came out with something called Tiller, which is personal finance. Yes, I signed up for that. I love that. Tiller, it's it's really you manage your money in a spreadsheet where it pulls all the data into the spreadsheet. But my favorite feature, and I told them this, is and I think it's about seventy nine dollars a year. I every day I get an email that shows me the previous day's transactions. Look at that, and I asked them to stop that on mine. Why is that? Because it just looked so many yeah, things. There out are there. a lot of things, <laughs> but I, I liked it because I was like, hey, there's a subscription which I probably would have missed. You know, I, every month when I get my Amex bill, I go through it with a pen and I check off what makes sense. What I'm like, hey, I don't recognize this. But because there were only five, six transactions the day before, instead of seeing a list of 30, I was able to identify. And I said, hey, we're still paying for this. And I was like, I thought I canceled it. It turns out the company didn't end up canceling it. But I, I, I sort of like that feature. Um, so there's a lot of tools. And we actually teamed up with Zevi Wallman over at Living Smarter Jewish. And they're doing really cool things as a resource. Um, but practically speaking, right, the median income in America is $68,000 per family, and that's based on the census. And depending on the community that people live in, the cost of living as an Orthodox Jew, and I want to get the numbers right, it can run anywhere from, you know, X thousand up to $400,000 in pre-tax revenue. And that means, and we've discussed this numbers over and over and over, is that you have to be in the top three to six percent of income earners in America to simply pay your bills, right? If you lived in middle America and you didn't have the expenses of yumtif, this and that, and it's a beautiful living, that's not the focus here. We wanna know how um, are people getting by? Do we see that they have to come up with out of box solutions just to make it work? Or it's a lot simpler than that and you really have to go through the numbers? or is this a catastrophe? Wait, is this, are we headed towards a cliff? First off. Okay. The American Financial Association or the financial anxiety scale indicates that people over about 120,000 revenue income actually have higher financial anxiety so you're right, that medium income for the American standard, what was it? About 68,000? 68,000 per yeah, family, I think yeah. I had about 75,000 on mine. So that, that's that, after the stimulus checks, now it's up to 75,000. Oh, okay, <laughs> so at that number, um, that's the median, at about 100, and, 100, 120 is when their financial anxiety goes up, not goes down. And so what we found as Jewish people, yeah. people's, financial anxiety actually goes up after 150,000, shockingly so, which is showing us that we believe that if we have more money, our financial anxiety will be less, and we're not seeing that. So what's the answer there? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's, well, first, yes, so first yeah, off, very interesting. And I've seen that over and over. Amazing. So there, um, that's first. Now, there are people that when they have that, income there are there are different resources available for them there people have opportunities to figure out pre-tax dollars how to sh to use pre-tax dollars how to shelter some money and the number one thing i can say from my business is i can have four people making 250,000 or 300 or 300 whatever number it is mm -hmm. and each one of those four people 
are spending it in very different ways. One of them may have $100,000 in debt, and one of them may have $200,000 in savings. And so it would be very difficult for me to say there's a one-size-fits-all, even if they're all in the same community in the same, on the same block. Interesting. And that has little to do with money and much more to do with values and much more to do with the way we see money, how we grew up. What does money mean to us? What do we, see, what is it, what do we want from money? Because money in its real raw sauce has very little intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. It's what we put on that money that gives it its value. And how much of that comes down to spending? Is the, is the person that has $200,000 um, in savings, is that because they're great investors? Is that because they don't splurge? Is that because they have stayed away from debt and they're not racking up crazy fees? What's what? And, and I know you said instilling value, but when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of it, what is that person doing that his neighbor is not? Mm -hmm. The two personal, I think, character traits that they have found that have created such savings has been frugality and, and social indifference. Those okay, so have been yeah. the two character traits that have been found to help people accrue wealth and savings. Tell frugality. me about yeah. And social indifference. So let's start with frugality. What does that mean? Is that being cheap, stingy? What? Oh, exactly. Who's going to decide what frugality is? Who's going to decide what cheap is? If I tell you don't eat chicken except, uh, you know, only eat chicken every night and only meat on weekends, is that frugal? If someone says only eat beans and chicken once a week. So everyone within what their limit is, what they decide, what they want to do. There, that's, that's what the idea is. That's what I love about what I do. When I sit with a couple and they get to make the decision, what do they want to do? Do they want to have the 200 in saving, 200,000 in saving, or they want 100,000 in savings? How do they want to get there? Mm -hmm. Their choice. But when they come with the, oh, God, what are you going to do? You're going to budget us? You're going to limit us? No, 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 no. I'm not limiting you. God forbid. What do you want for your life? Mm. Let's look at your financial landscape for your future, for your long-term future. And when you look at it like that and you envision my long-term, now my money could start working different things. Now I'm my, with one eye on my future, my here becomes less important. Mm -hmm. My there is where I got to look. And social indifference, that's staying away from peer pressure? Mm-hmm. Right, looking, you can look down the block and you could see someone driving, a, you know, a beautiful car, but you don't know what's funding that vehicle. And I should have so said that pain point before, where it's how is everyone else doing it? How much is normal? Those are such strong pain points when people come in. People want to know how much the other one's making. How, how does much? everyone do? Why do they? How, do, how, how come they could do it all? Right. Look at their husband's driving that. Look at his. Look at her. She gets all those things. Look at his. She, I saw the jewelry she's wearing. I saw the car he's driving. Right. So if you have a family not making ends meet, what's the point in creating a budget? They know, they know they're going to sit with you and walk out or so they think dejected. Yep. See you. Told you, honey. The numbers just don't add up. Why do we even go? Now I know the exact number in which I'm falling short. What's the point in creating a budget? You know, that, to me, that sounds like, ma'am, I hate paying for gas, and my gas odometer is, is broken, but I'm going to make a long road trip, and when I believe it's empty, I'm going to fill it up. Don't worry about it. I, I don't have to fix it. Is there, is there a problem with that? Yeah, unless they're... Driving a Tesla or a, an electric oh, oh, oh. vehicle. Yes. Okay. Big problem. All right. That's what we're dealing with. Yeah. You need to know what's in the tank. Sort of. And you, if and you can't If we want to get somewhere. It. Right. So, so they walk in. Let's say they are in mountains and mountains of credit card debt. How do you, how do you solve that issue or at least try to tackle it? First of all, it could be it's as scary as they believe and it could be it's not as scary as they believe. And I think very often they give the example of a rooftop where you go onto the roof 
and the thought of your finances is frightening. It's like no gates looking down. How scary is that? Mm -hmm. All right. right. But putting in a financial plan in place is putting up those fences. Now, if I have those financial plan in place, now will I look down at my finances? I'll step on top of that little tip of the roof and look all the way down because I'm not scared because there's a protection. And that's what we want to do. We want to create that protection to let you look down. Let's talk success stories. Tell mm -hmm. me, tell me without names, tell me someone who came in and where were they X months later, a year later, two years later? We have so many. So we have people that have come in $150,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. By mere working with the not, not again, we work with the numbers as a framework, but working with the system of this money psychology and just understanding how it impacts you. Uh, I, have, I have people who have now generated revenues over well over 500,000, coming in 150, running over 10 years, $150,000 year after year in debt. Now over 500,000 pl plus in revenue. Um, you meaning <laughs> sitting in their bank that they have cash liquidity yes not that they're earning five hundred thousand dollars a year but they're able they're, they they're now above water. have so now yeah. they have five hundred thousand it's about three and a half years later they have five hundred thousand dollars sitting in a separate account mm -hmm. and do you advise them further or to speak to someone to say how can you get the most out of that money or yeah, once, that's not my that's not your job that's not your my job position is, my right. Pi right i'm before a financial advisor okay i don't help people with that okay understood um, I have people that have come in and haven't even, we have an area filling out how much debt you have. They start filling it out, and I think I have about 20 lines there, and there weren't enough lines for that person. What and are some of those lines? Like, uh, credit card debt, one, what, num what, what, what bill is it? How much is the rate? How much is the balance, right? Your liabilities. And there, wasn't, there weren't enough lines. Wow. And he put in over about a million dollars, and he... He, he couldn't he, he couldn't call me back. He was so shaken. He didn't realize that he was in a million dollars worth of debt. Wow. Uh, he he's about a year and a half later. All he he's just he has about three hundred thousand dollars left in there, but he's cleaning everything up. The feeling for him, he's like on a totally different. He's like I never realized little things, amount of money I spend on 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 stupidities like on dips or of Shabbos. I'm spending about a hundred dollars. I never even noticed. Not that every little thing now. It's just like why should I put it there? I must rather pay up my debt. I right, never right. realized what's going on in my life. All these little things. Um, it's just it's such a good feeling to be able to get all my nachas calls and and, and again, sometimes the fact that that they're not nervous anymore i had a client that he came in but he couldn't walk into the office because the fear of looking at his numbers were so huge that he would sit on the steps and have to do breathing exercises before he came in to look at his numbers there's the emotion that comes into play again yeah and and so now he's like I, i'm making more than i ever did i'm able to look at my bank account and see numbers and not have a panic attack I, I feel like a, a newborn person. I, I'm like renew. Right. So it's 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 a great feeling. The name of your website is what? Prosper. P R O S P R. We leave out the e for excuses. Dot F I T. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of excuses over the years, right? I don't even listen. You don't listen, right? You just roll your eyes and. No, say, no, don't roll my eyes. We understand. There's a softness to it all. That's okay. the whole difference. That's really what the difference is. We, we, we understand that it's, it's not easy. Money, finances is not easy. It's the most fascinating topic. Uh, I, 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 I'm very passionate about it. And I, I, I understand how many emotions come into place. There are financial traumas. There are financial shame and guilt. And Yeah, I mean, when it comes to feedback on these, on these podcasts, it's been enormous. It, it impacts everyone maybe to different degrees, maybe differently, but people are saying, thank you. Thank you for starting this conversation. Thank you for, um, you know, I was driving with my wife and we're listening in the car and, you know, I, I was expecting maybe to be a little bit more male dominant feedback, but then uh, people says, here's a voice note from my wife. She said she loves the, the, the podcast. Here are different ideas for guests and topics to discuss. Um, and these aren't just like specifically Jewish issues. I had an old coworker 
Um, he's not Jewish. We released the first episode recently, and he messaged me. He's like, that was great. And he says, is student debt? He goes, I, I listened to it. I had to Google some of the terms. I didn't understand. I'm learning about your culture. It's great. He says, do you see a lot of student debt, and I'll ask you this, in inside people's um, calculations when they come back to you? Is student debt a, a, a big issue in the Orthodox Jewish community or most parents are paying off that debt. It's not so much the children that are paying it. Because I know student debt is, is a huge topic. Um, he says within his community, everyone has student debt and they're trying to pay it down. But then I thought about it and I said, hey, you know, parents are sending their kids to Toro College. The kids, you know, an 18-year-old kid out of seminary, they're not being tasked with spending, you know, the $6,000 per semester or whatever it is. Do you see a lot of student debt? I I see more. Um, I don't see. I wouldn't say that is the debt that I'm dealing with on a larger scale. I mm -hmm. see some of it, but I wouldn't say that's. An, I would say that would be maybe forty thirty percent of the debt that they're dealing with. And people even look at that as if it's not debt. When they're looking at student debt, they're like, oh, but that no, oh, oh, oh I forgot I even have student debt because that that's like not even a debt because that's that was, that was education. Part of my, right. right. Um, and so when we're actually d working with debt, and for people that are working with debt out there, you should just be aware there are a couple of ways of dealing with debt. And you can try to Google. There are something called an avalanche or a snowball. There's a debt calculator. Have you ever heard of the debt calculator? I've heard of it only because I, I've been doing a little bit of research. I see one of Dave Ramsey's free tools is a debt calculator. I wouldn't want to click on it because, God forbid, but... Um, yeah, that that was. But but what is that? Oh, great! I love the debt calculator. I find it that is, I think, a visual learning for people that is so eye opening for people. So what the debt calculator does is you put in all your debt, your balance, uh, your interest rate, the amount you're currently paying, and the, and then on the bottom of it, it will show you how many payments you have left how much interest you'll pay on the life of the loan mm -hmm. and when you'll be debt free. Then you have an option to add a little bit of money and then you can either keep everything as is and it will tell you the order in which you'll pay it down or you can add a, a custom field. You can either change it to something called snowball or avalanche. What are those two options? Avalanche means you take the highest interest rate. Think of an avalanche, big, coming down, big snowball mm -hmm. coming down. So you take the highest interest rate and then you apply that extra amount, so whether it's $100, $50, just a little bit amount, to the highest interest rate. When that credit card finishes, whatever that amount that you're paying gets applied to the next one. And they show you how to do that. And it shows you right on bottom how much interest you're gonna save in total and how many years you have just reduced from your entire, from your entire debt. Mm -hmm. It's eye-opening, or you could do snowball. Snowball is reducing the lowest balance. So why, why do, right? So not the highest interest rate, but the lowest balance card first. And again, you take the amount that you're paying on that and apply it to the next one. It will take a little bit longer that way. But Depending on how much that is, it, the interest rate will probably be a little higher. You're paying a little higher interest. Uh -huh. Why do people like to do that? It's an emotional win. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people like to just get rid of things quicker. Right, right, right. So whichever way makes people feel better, go with it. Just get rid of the debt. You mentioned earlier financial literacy and starting at a young age. How do you educate your children at home? Do you give them allowances? Um, what are best practices when it comes to financial education, leaving the schools out of it, assuming that they're hopefully going to do their part in terms of teaching children and young adults and teenagers. What do you do at home? How do you educate, if at all? Great question. Great question. And every family does this differently. For us, we play, we play games. We're a game family, first of all. So we play cash flow. That's a, that's a fun game that we play. Okay. We also have a lot of money discussions. Yako, we got to put cash flow in the show notes, like an Amazon link for people to buy it. There's a cash flow for kids, a cash flow for adults. Okay. Um, there's a rich dad, poor dad game. You know, oh, there is. Okay. So my friend just read the book. He said he loves it. Oh, yeah. Um, there's, there's, uh, so we, we have a lot of money discussions. So we'll have a discussion like, you know, if you got $100 today, um, 
we went to the toy store, what would you want to buy with it? Or we would have just different discussions about, as my children are older now, getting older now, about if they were to get engaged and they had different options, how would they choose, what would they choose? And it really just gets them to think. In addition to that, I really give them a lot of, um, I, I give them access to money. It's cute. We always had this in our house with Nash. I always believe that if you give them a lot of Nash and have that ability and not hide it, then they sort of will get used to it. And I happen to have healthy children. I don't think it works for everyone, mm-hmm. but my kids are those types that they're not interested really in the Nash. And so I guess somewhat of it, I believe the same with money where I allow them to make the choices when we go out and shop. And I say, do you, do you, do you need that? Or is that a want or a need? If you, you know, and sometimes we do the wants, but... They get an understanding. I am a working mom. They have seen it. I've been a single mom, so they've saw the sh- seen the struggle of what money brings. It hasn't come easy for them. Mm-hmm. So I can't say that they that for ev- this works for everyone, mm-hmm. but they know that there is a cost to money. Mom works and brings the money. Dad works, brings the money, and money buys things. They get to make decisions on that. They get to go to camp, to seminary, mm-hmm. make weddings, and all that. We do have discussions. So important. I think a lot of this is just awareness, not necessarily keeping them in some rigid program, but the more they're aware that money doesn't grow on trees and there's decisions that have to be made, um, it can only help them as they grow older. Um, Would you like to see more financial literacy in schools? Would you like to see that as part of the well, curriculum? Would love it, and I, I especially see with the teenagers, they should be allowed to experiment and experience what it feels like to to use money, to but to understand limitations of it, because I think a huge um, a huge help for people as they grow up is delayed gratification. If the one thing that you could learn is delayed gratification. Mm-hmm that allows you to take that one step. And if you asked me before, what, how do you get the emotion away and look at the picture logically? It's that delayed gratification, right? So if I can delay that emotion or delay that, what I'm looking at to see, do I really need it, do I want it? Or is this my emotion playing with me? I especially see it now with house hunting, mm-hmm. hugely with the house market today. People are so worried that they're not going to get a house. The interest rates are so low. They have to buy something that's way higher than they could afford because they're going to lose the interest rate amount. Right, right. And it's like, it's this frenzy when they can't even afford it. For those listening in the year 2035, we did shoot this podcast in 2021. The housing market is out of control. I mean, so, so you would say, don't worry so much about the interest rate. Focus more on the sale price, what you can afford. Mm. But th- there's so there's so little options that I mean, anything you want is far higher than what it was two three years ago in terms of sale price. Do people should people just continue renting and and wait it out? So is the answer that we buy something because there may be a limit now when we can't afford it? Comes back to the numbers. Can't you can't do something that you. Can't aff- you, you can't use money you don't have to pay for you something you might not need. Do a sh- there's sometimes there's a stretch and then there's there's suicide. Right, right. There's financial suicide too. And and it's a large purchase. It's, we're not talking about a bagel and cream cheese here. It's uh, And it hurts for a long time. It hurts for a long time. Right. A lot of these early decisions you see in in couples in their early start of their marriages, they're still dealing with it in their 40s and 50s. It's... And, they're, and, and what happens is it's not just the house they're buying. They also have to outfit the house. They have to maintain the house. Mm. And those are things they didn't take into account when they just bought the expensive home. Wow, wow. So what would you say as, as closing remarks to people listening here um, that have been on the fence to going to a money manager? We're not going to call it a budgeter. Um, what's the official title of what you do? I'm not a money manager. No, but what's what? How do you? How do you? <laughs> so are you a money there, coach? Are you a there, budgeter? I'm a financial coach, financial counselor, and a financial therapist. All oh three. wow! And so the difference is, is um, there's financial counseling deals with debt. Financial coaching deals uh, with assisting positively making goals, setting goals, and moving forward. Financial counseling deals with 
financial therapy deals with the emotion emotional aspect of it. So I don't have the financial advising, which is dealing with where your money goes. Okay. So people will come to me prior to that because they want to figure out where their money should go. But once they go to a financial advisor, very often it's just deciding where the money goes, but they don't really know how much money they want to allocate. Right. So it's on the step before that. Um, people will go to any anyone, any a person can reach out to any sort of money coach, money counselor, money helper to help them get their life in order and they can help they could google different spreadsheets or just take the first step sit down and look at what you're spending just look be curious be curious i can't tell you how many times people have come in and say i can't i never realized i just didn't realize the idea is when you're curious and you notice you get to make choices habits are not choices beautiful yeah, and, and we wanted to collaborate with others, and that's why when we tapped into Zevi, you know, with all their resources, and, you know, there's so many organizations out there that can help. You just have to seek it out, right? It's not going to fall into your lap. You need to, like you said, be curious. So I do hope uh, the listeners here and the viewers are curious. Um, seek out help. It's out there, and uh, we'll all be more financially fit. Thank you so much for joining us, Zevi. Thank you for having me, and good luck to all. Take care. Something tells me we'll be seeing a lot more of Simi in the coming days, months, and years. If you need financial help, be sure to reach out to our friends at info at livingsmarterjewish.org. They have a budgeting sheet for you. Just email them. They'll send it your way. Check out their website. It's a work in progress, but it'll be an amazing resource for you. Check them out. This podcast is brought to you by Living L'Chaim. I love that little jingle at the end where my brother Yako says, Doo-doo-doo, Living L'Chaim. It's awesome. Anywho, big shout out to him. Check out his podcasts network on YouTube. Search Living L'Chaim. Make sure you subscribe there. And also Kosher Money. That's me. Kosher Money. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, follow, subscribe. Be sure to hit the five star and leave a review, especially on Apple. It helps us a lot. Until next time, keep your money kosher. You can find out more about kosher money by visiting livinglechaim.com and you can see the other podcasts that we're going to have there. This podcast has been hosted by my brother, Ellie Langer, produced by me, Jakob Langer, and brought to you by Living L'Chaim. Till next time, enjoy life. Living L'Chaim.